Oh, I know that. I know about that. Peter Fortunato is in the live stream, so I'm waiting. So after I can go over to Schwartz. I'm the program and grant director of the Community Arts Partnership and have been for 30 years. Uh, and the Spring Rights Festival is one of our annual programs. We've got a bunch. We also have six grant programs and we just launched our Creative Recovery Fund. So if you're an artist or represent a nonprofit in Tompkins County, it's all on our website, which is artspartner.org. It's A R T S partner.org. And you can also access the springrights.org website from artspartner.org. Spring rights has to be spelled. It's spring, W-R-I-T-E-S dot org. And I hope that you look at the rest of the events. There's more readings. There's four th five things tomorrow, which is Sunday, Saturday. Oh, there's about four things on Saturday and five things on Sunday. And then workshops continue all the way through June. Most are on Zoom. And there's a couple of live live ones that are being live streamed. So I am, uh, I don't need you to stay on mute or use the chat heavily. <laughs> um, oh, I'm gonna send everyone who attended an event a little survey asking you how you heard about the event. And that's so we can spend money in the right places and not spend money in the wrong places. So if you're not one of the writers, readers tonight, I'm going to give you a little clipboard where you can put your name and address, uh, email address. And when you get that survey in June, if you could fill it out, that would be great. Probably going to do some sort of a raffle, like win $25 if you fill out the survey. I'd like to thank our wonderful Spring Ride sponsors, which are Ithaca College, Wegmans, m and Bank, CFCU Community Credit Union, the Odyssey Bookstore, and the Ithaca Marriott. We receive grant support from New York State Council on the Arts, Poets and Writers, and Tompkins County Tourism. And our media sponsors are Ithaca Voice, WITH Radio, and WSKG. Oh, and most recently, WBBR. Um, there is another event tonight at 7 o'clock, I think. There's an event called Forbidden Future. And I wish I had the description up here with me, but it is with Dmitry Baikov, who is uh, a Russian writer who is here with Ithaca City of Asylum. And then someone, I'm so sorry if they're on this call, a professor whose name uh, that I don't have of Russian literature and events, and they're just basically going to discuss, have a discussion tonight. Um, I think I'll just hand you a list of the upcoming events instead of trying to memorize what they are. So uh, we begin. I'm going to turn this event over to Jerry Merskin, and hello to our live stream audience, and thanks for being here. By the way, the link that the live stream is on will then become the tape of this event. So you could go back tomorrow and it'll be the video. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. And I just wanted to say to those assembled here that everybody who's not here is live streaming. And to those who are live streaming, you're lucky because all the seats are taken here. <laughs> Standing room only. Standing room. As far as the eye can see. <laughs> Um, well, thanks for being here. I just wanted to let you know, in case anybody ever asks you, you can treat 
tree falls in the forest and there's nobody there to hear it, does it make a sound? The answer is no. So you'll know because it'd be on the test. And the reason I say that is because I have the same feeling about poetry um, that it takes place, it comes into being in the listener's ear before that is, it, it's not really happening. Um, anyway, um, I proposed a reading for spring rights um, before the war. Uh, in Ukraine, and I'm tempted from past practice to say the Ukraine. My grandparents were from Kiev when it was part of Russia. Um, once the war started, I thought, how can a writer uh, who's going to speak in public but not address the war? Um, I have poems that speak to my grandparents' experience. I could do that. I know others could too. Uh, but I thought the original idea uh, reflecting on the kinds of confrontations that we experience personally and what we understand from those encounters remains relevant as our personal experiences inform our collective well-being. Um, so I asked local writers, writers who have an ability to cast a spell, uh, to participate, and I'm grateful that Mary, Roger, David, Dan, and Evan agreed to read. Um, if there's time at the end, um, maybe we'll have a conversation. All right. Um, thanks so much, Jerry. Thanks for including me in this. Um, and and Robin and everyone there at the who's made Spring Rights a thing that can happen. It's such a beautiful part of our community. And all right, all right, Mr. Analog, we're fine. Um, <laughs> It's, it's really lovely to be able to participate in Spring Rights and to be here with you all. And it's nice. Um, I'm going to read, I was like, what's your confrontation? I don't know. We've all been trapped in our houses for so long. Who are we confronting? And so this is, this book actually came out um, a couple of months ago. And it is full of, full of sort of domestic poems. There's poems concerned with the fatherhood and husbandry understood broadly. And I was like, there's a fair amount of, you know, <laughs> Of conflict that comes in in that, so I thought I would I would actually just be um, I'd limit myself to these things. So um, I'm Dan Rosenberg. I am an associate professor of English up at Wells College, just a half hour up the lake. And um, yeah, I don't know. They're about him, <laughs> this kid. Um, actually, no, this one precedes you, but this this is called cause and effect. Um, because we are so thoughtless, we kiss each other on the holes we speak from. We cross our legs upon each other, angling in, always angling in. The fireplace is electric, but that doesn't stop our melding on the hardwood. Because we are so hungry, we stare like owls at the bar-lit faces of strangers we know we're supposed to want. You are a deep sea diver, and I'm an inactive volcano. <laughs> You're a starfish, and I'm a rash from a wetsuit. <laughs> you are four honeymooners, and I'm the blonde walking by. Because we are so close, our fingertips catch. You plunge us into the ocean. I speak in bubbles. You grow a shell, and I'm the grit in your mantle. We irritate each other. We produce a pearl. Mm. Um, yeah, this one is is called Two Miles, January 2015. But he's here coloring right now. Um, how do you feel about being all over this book? Yeah. Good, good, good answer. Two Miles, January 2015. You burnish my residue, little man partially formed and incapable of lying. When I think I can't be chewed anymore, you're on my arm, head whipping like a kill shake, a deranged and gummy harmonica solo. <laughs> Concave mirror, dirty bundle of need, but I am full as the world of need for you. Full as fire. You wear me to the wick and I keep dancing. For you, I turn the record, snap the straps, 
harness you to my chest. I groove my path around the room for you. I strengthen my back and bear and bear. Um, let's see this one. Th these poems are um, usually in in a variety of sort of formal structures that don't um, don't follow traditional patterns. But this here is in blank verse <laughs> because um, this is called order. And I was thinking a lot about um, having a small child who disrupts your life and then the expectation as that small child grows that you can somehow order the world for them that you can you can make it make sense um and what we do when someone just arrives with expectations that we don't feel prepared to meet right um i guess i'm understanding conflict very broadly here but here we go order i hear you wake before i'm up myself and snap to ready now before my eyes crack from their crud to face your face today. I hear you blunder toward my door. I hear you crash it wide. The loosened hinges shiver their frame and now the house itself, awake to the world and you, complicit, pulls me hard as thunder from my sleep. You beat the echoes to me, blear-faced, awash with night sweat. You drag a bunny by the ears to bed and tumble graceless up the mattress, silent, a drowsy rocket wanting, wanting something I'm not awake enough to understand, but will be soon, my son. And then we'll go to blaze the day, to stomp each puddle left by the rain you never notice as you pull me into the world, all leap and bowl, all grab and fall. Today I'll wake up better, Call the distance order, order it to be a smaller thing. I'll stand to make it so. Hmm. Um, maybe I'll just, I'll end on this one. The, the trajectory of the, of the book moves sort of from the, from sort of difficulty in, in conception and union and the world sort of collapses into like, a little trivalent universe and then slowly opens up again as, um, you know, as Miles develops language and becomes a human and not just like a little pile of meat. Um, and it's the laughter of people with small children over here. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I love that poem that then I've spent in my back and bear and bear. Last time I saw you, we took a walk and Miles was on your back yeah. and we're carrying him. Would you read a poem with him on your shoulders? It's <laughs> <laughs> a lot older. No, I've not strengthened my back that much. Uh, but uh, but you want to show back? Not right now. Not right now. Okay. Okay. Veto, Jerry. I got you. Um, Just ask you. Have in the past, maybe not. <laughs> maybe not so much in, in the present or future. Uh, uh, this this one's. A little different. So it's 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 the last one I'll read, and it's out. Um, it's from the the latter part of the book, where the sort of gaze of the book has broadened again, has opened up into the wider world and beyond a little bit. Um, it's called uh, Spaceman Specimen. On this planet, we hadn't yet saddled. A blanket of craters extended to a too near horizon. We had the just lights of science within us as we pulled him from the, hop, from the foxhole like an ingrown hair. He was difficult to see straight, slipping from our vision center, but we were on a mission full of orders. I remember the trail his passing left, thick milk that smelled of pecan pie, of my partner's first wife's shampoo. We spilled it behind us as we threaded him from crater to empty crater. I caught a sense of legs moving in unison. He never spoke in words, and we learned that to hold his arms was to hold a breach of dust gently, gently. We thought we seemed like sun gods to him and his trembling some kind of worship and the milk dripped from his fingers as if crushed from foreign stones. 
This was after we jammed our little flags into much of the planet, sent our reports back through an endlessly possible sky. We did it in triplicate. We were heroes. Mm. That's me. Um, thank you very much. Hello, everybody. I want to thank Gary for inviting me to be part of this project, be part of this reading, and I'm really thrilled to be meeting all these new poets for the first time. So, uh, so this is very cool for me. Uh, and, huh? Oh, my name. Yeah, I guess that's useful. My name's Roger Hecht, and uh, kind of, I've been, I'm, I've been here in Ithaca for a while. I teach. Uh, teach English and creative writing at SUNY Oneonta, uh, but I am rooted. Yes, it's worth a cough. <laughs> I choke every time I get in the car to drive there, but I love my job and I love my students and I love coming back home afterwards. Um, so the, I'm going to, I was thinking about this poetry, confrontation, and, you know, I suppose the act of writing is a kind of confrontation, you know, confronting an empty screen or an empty page. Um, of course, we will write about confrontation. I don't necessarily write about like personal confrontation. I don't, it's just kind of not where my, I tend to focus my attention, but I like kind of inventing fake histories. And so this poem is actually um, directly inspired by Evan, um, who will be reading shortly. Uh, he emailed me um, just three words and a link to a Wikipedia page called uh, Notable Ego Shortages. Mm -hmm. And so somebody wrote a Wikipedia page about egos, and we all know what egos are, cool round baubles. And a subtopic was notable ego shortages. And apparently there were moments in history where there were notable ego shortages. And so I thought, okay, what are the possible causes of an ego shortage? So this is a fictional history of ego waffles, notable ego shortages. 1898. This is a one poem, it's in four parts, so it's a little bit long. So uh, 1898, the hurricane that tore Galveston off the map is better known, but a storm two years prior made mincemeat of Puerto Rico, swamped with 28 days of rain. Small egg production from family farms and smuggling routes, rum roads that long predated the charge up San Juan Hill were decimated. Factory owners scrambled to make new egg to make new egg networks viable to meet consumer demand, rising vigorously since the introduction of Lego to the nation's vocabulary. By then, the government had commandeered much of the poultry industry to feed its forces readying for war. Only a diversion of troops en route to Cuba prevented food riots in several East Coast cities. 1936. The factory workers had had enough. Their pay was pennies. Hours on their feet with few scheduled breaks, barely enough time to pee when they got any relief. They sweated severely in their germ-free suits. It was scorchingly hot on the baking floors. In the cooling rooms, their gloves for handling waffle, the waffles were paper thin, no insulation. Some men were even hospitalized with frostbite. Discipline was strict, no talking, even during lunch breaks. Spies were everywhere. The three men who conceived of the strike met surprisingly in the open, in the diner across the street. Their code, the number of chews before they swallowed their donuts. Despite the goons, there were networks, ways of getting the word out, the date set. When the shift changed, no one moved. The managers worked in offices next door. The gates were shut. Overseers were shoved out open windows. The plant was theirs. 
When the police charged the building, workers pelted them with frozen disks that hit their targets with surprising accuracy. Cops were stunned, but no one was hurt. During the stalemate that followed, the workers maintained discipline among themselves, even formed their own government that became a model for aspiring countries years later. The most important rule, no one abuses the product. While they hated management, they loved their waffles. Once during the weekly talent show, some palooka danced a hula wearing nothing but waffles strung together as a bikini. He was seized, tried, tried, and summarily convicted by the workers' court and expelled from the factory, tossed down the chute where the burnt waffles go. The workers <laughs> cheered then, then cheered even louder when the strike ended 43 days later. The country cheered to sick of their diet of muesli. <laughs> 1983. The source of the illness was a mystery. The waffles, the syrup, possibly overripe fruit. Maybe it was simply the flu. But one patient became a dozen, a dozen became scores. The symptoms all the same. Stomach distress, fever, some were racked with convulsions. When a child died, people panicked. The recall encompassed over 30 states. Factories were shut down, cleaned and, and inspected, then recleaned and reinspected. Then the extortion notes came. They demanded ransom and public statements admitting to crimes both preposterous and utterly humiliating. The sample poisons the criminal sent to prove that they were the agents of the illness, the agents of the apocalypse they hoped to rain down on the country to prove their intent. Just as mysteriously, the illness is stopped. No one can say for certain if the ransom was paid or statements were said, since no one ever said. This is it's a history, but it's a projecting into the I, originally I wrote that when I wrote this the date of this next section was 2021 uh, so I and a little bit too close to reality so I had to push it off a couple of a couple of years so 2025 so if you want your egos now stock up or you want your egos then stock up now 2025 after years in a state of anxiety, with trade wars resulting in ground wars and domestic rivalries churning into violence, the nation's sense of trust was shredded meat. Anything would be accepted as a sign of hope. That an ego was the medium is no surprise. Their slogan, a cry of independence, had unofficially replaced Nimitrede Pa as the nation's motto. So the savior's face first appeared on a buttermilk waffle on a day worker's breakfast table. A story easy enough to dismiss had not a retiree found a similar image singed into his buckwheat waffle by a secondhand panini press, something that had never happened to white toast. When church officials confirmed the events, the run on egos overwhelmed the company. What first seemed a miracle a spike in sales in the middle of a recession became a curse. Demand outstripped production. Small riots erupted, Wegmans, erupted at Wegmans stores on both coasts. Sensing a crisis to exploit, venture capitalists moved in. Production ramped up as waffle plants ran three shifts, but the promised infrastructure never panned out. Only debt. First thing the new board sold off was the lucrative egg distribution system developed in the wake of the crisis of 1898. The next thing to go, stakes in wheat production to foreign investors planning the next drought. Bit by bit, truck, the truck fleets, the cardboard plants, even spare tires were sold to the highest and often to the lowest bidders. Aging factories were sold for scrap. The unions, which years before traded power for stock options were useless. No number of free blessed prayer towels could save the company. By then, the savior's face was appearing in everywhere, 
in pizzas, energy bars, sunburns, the peel back can lids of cat food cans, <laughs> anywhere the citizens' fevered imaginations could put it. The only thing left to sell was the company's name, which a collective, or, a collective of artisanal bakers backed with cannabis money snagged at a fire sale price. That we still have egos at all might be the miracle of this story. <laughs> Fun with history and and egos. Thank you, Evan, for for for, for giving me that that inspiration. Um, I'm just going to read one since that was kind of a long one. I'm just going to read one one more poem, kind of in the same vein, I think, but uh, less focused on history and more on language. It's called Sunlight Beckons Beyond the Dumpster. A 12 year old daughter reading a novel comes across a new word. She asks, what is dauntless? I say, to lack daunt, to be without it, as if that helps. She asks, so do we have any? I have to say, I don't know. No one ever asked, and I wouldn't know where to look. The bookshelf, the back of the fridge, nothing. So next time I'm downtown and some worn out guy stretches out a hand, I'll have to shrug, point to my hips and make the empty pocket gesture and say with my face, maybe next time, bro, because you see, I'm dauntless. And I'd walk away embarrassed because maybe that's a lie. And I have some beside the quarters in my car's cup holder that I didn't give to the guy with the sign on the corner near Dunkin' Donuts when I stopped at the light. Or not, because probably, really, I'm dauntless, which is not to say I'm undaunted, since that presumes I once had it, or having lost it, plan to get some more. Getting some, what would I do with it? What would anyone do? Invest it, I guess but not in a bank, not at these rates. I'd have to find a firm, invest aggressively, take risks, get it at the source, mine, or uh, watch my donk grow, buy up companies, sell off the parts, get it at the source, mines, mineral rights, key lanes of transport, workers toiling night and day, mountaintops removed, slick water horizontal drill rigs churning, whole forests leveled and replanted to monocrop daunt because there's only so much of it and so much need. And if there isn't need, I'll make it with ads on the Sunday morning talk shows and BuzzFeed pop-ups. So long as I can keep the unions out, easy enough if I spread some around the right people. But really, I'm not that ambitious and I don't think myself greedy. I just want enough for me. How I get it doesn't matter. Let's just say I met a guy who knows a guy who has a connection and told me where to meet him in the alley behind the shore mark. Yes, it costs more than I want, but I don't get to set the price. I meet the man who offers me a taste because that's good business. I can feel my cheeks flush and that pleasant buzzing on my gums. But around the back, around the block, there's another two guys waiting, which I should have expected. I don't resist, but I don't show fear. My impulse is to stare at the gun, but I look the guy right in the eye. He's scared too and refuses my gaze. His partner rifles my pocket, shoves me hard against the dumpster. I hold my own, chest out, heart racing on the verge of tears. It's snowing maybe, or raining, or maybe the sun is out and a warm breeze is telling me to pull myself out of the shadows and start the day on a firmer foot. But I remain on the greasy bricks, stuck in darkness where I am, fearful and needy, full of remorse, undaunted, and still dauntless. <laughs> Thanks so much.
Hi, I'm Evan Williams. I'm here to give you some fun history, too. Um, this is a piece called Tuileries, April 1968. Uh, it's a piece that I co-wrote with two ghostwriters. Um, it appeared last year in Punhula, which is a, a new journalist based out of Barcelona, a quadrant journal, interestingly. Uh, it's forthcoming in my second collection, which is ready for launch uh, in time now. Um, so this is an imagined confrontation between W.H. Martin and Mothman. Paris. Um, so there's a lot of potential for misunderstanding. Um, Auden, W.H. Auden was a British-American poet, um, well known for writing The Age of Anxiety, uh, which has been described as one of the most talked about and least read epic poems of the 20th century. Um, in fact, it has had quite a profound an impact on my recent work, though I have not read it. <laughs> um, Mothman, some of you may uh, remember, is or was uh, a cryptid described as a large flying man with 10 foot wings and red glowing eyes, uh, who was sighted several times in West Virginia in the 1960s. Uh, there were claims that Mothman was somehow uh, linked or involved with various strange and eerie occurrences in, in West Virginia, and possibly to the collapse of the suspension bridge <laughs> over the Ohio River. Um, but, you know, I've always wondered, you know, if these cryptids exist, uh, Mothman, vampires, and, and the wolves, and, and Chupacabra, and all of that, you know, is it possible that they might just harbor much more normal suburban ambitions? Um, get the werewolf cubs off to soccer practice, and that sort of thing. Uh, and that may be true with, with poets as well. So this is a piece about the confrontation between two uh, in, unlikely interlocutors and also maybe the confrontation between truth and perception. So, this is Tuileries, April 1968. Early rays of spring blade the grass, trace the faint scars of the religious wars on the old ramparts, glance the new bronze nudes convened by the Ministry of Culture. All is bright and fine, but something here has been removed, W.H. Auden suspects, some tinge of laughter. Do you remember a puppet theater here? Or in another garden, another city? He sits, breathes slowly, considers the decorated moat between poetry and being. He does not scribble in his little notebook. Mothman slouches in his heavy overcoat. He sees the fellow with the notebook. They, make, they always make up stories. How mighty are the flaps from the east as they clash against the west. Those eyes that glow like nuclear spheres. Legends born of cathode ray fever. It was true that he had been at the ordinance works. The later sightings were figments. The slander of the silver bridge was the final indignity. <laughs> he watches and wonders what has remained unwritten. Later, as the sun coppers and the tops of the trees insinuate in the wind, these two flaneurs <coughs> of the green terraces meet at the ledge of the octagonal basin. You are not a newsman, then, one ventures? Not as such. Tell the truth. I do try. They gaze over the still pool for a moment. But you see, there's always a temptation to hold on to the truth for yourself. It's a matter of pride. You might hold on to it so long as it so long that it loses all possible significance. But that is the way of all earthly vices. You hoard and you hoard until it is all worthless. As a bearer of truth, to maintain your ethical dominion, you must relinquish it. So you must have words? Yes, the right words. And so you loll on the bank of the epistemic waters, knowing that the expression will never be exact, but worrying at it anyhow until this truth that was at first so compressed, so luminous, is plied into these droll little figurations, some first perhaps. But not the truth. O oh, statue of my pages, the poet would later write, Creature gliding overhead, ascend quietly.
everybody. I'm David Weiss. Uh, thanks, Jerry, for inviting me. Glad to be here. Uh, and also, let me say to Caroline Bannering how sad I am she's not here to read with us tonight. Maybe we'll reprise um, the confrontation thing uh, in this very small group together. How uh, really small, maybe. Okay. Uh, well, uh, on the subject of confrontation and grief, the thing that came to mind was, I think, W, um, sorry, WB8 said, of our arguments with others, we make rhetoric. Mm -hmm. Of our arguments with ourselves, we make poetry. Mm -hmm. It's a little too bifurcated, perhaps, a little like saying perfection of the line of life and perfection of the art, but they both get at, at something there that's touchy and, uh, and, uh, and, and meaningful. Uh, it's probably truer to say uh, of our arguments with others inside ourselves. Poetry <laughs> that might uh, sneak confrontation in the back. Uh, but I took the assignment seriously, um, and uh, I'll really do two or three poems to see how long that will take. Practice. Um, uh, so uh, Elizabeth Cotton, great, great blues. Uh, guitar player, left-handed guitar player, who gave us the phrase uh, cotton picking because she because she picked it with her left hand. Um, and one a song a song she wrote when she was eleven, freight train, freight famous song, right? Freight train, freight train, running so fast, freight train, freight train, running so fast. Please don't tell them what train I'm on. They won't know what route I'm on. Hmm. It's it's a, it's a very sweet, odd song, light. It's very light. It's light the way rural road is light, but it ends with life is but a dream. Right? Mm. And so I kind of wrote something about what's missing in the poem. Not really her version of what's missing, but just what maybe, what I felt was missing, or I just took, took the situation. Because it's, she wrote it early in, in, the in the 20th century before the Great Migration, but it has that Great Migration feel of getting out, trying to get to it. Uh, although the rest of the, the rest of the song is, is doesn't really go there. It's it's really interesting. Anyway, so this is uh, this is my ins how she uh, kind of got me that stuff. So it's called "Please Don't" from that line. Please don't. Please don't, she said. The ditches were shiny with water. Water, nervy, wind. He was standing too close across the road. She held a suitcase by the handle between its latches. It was spring, bright, cold, nothing yet starting to grow. Her coat was too thin. She had no sweater on. He, much too close, his head in his hands. Please don't, she said to the knives in the air. From the cold, her eyes teared. A car stopped, and she got in. She looked around. The look said, please don't tell what train I'm on. He placed a stone at her head, a stone at her feet. North was south, west was east. It was colder than she was, colder than him. Bells like talons came down from the sky. Please don't, she said, don't make this something it's not. Birds were being flown away, no tears in their eyes. A dog stood on three legs, panting by the woods, all bone and skin. It was home, if home were no such thing. Hardly spring, no gold in the goldenrod, no burrs on the burdock. Where she was going, harder than gone. The stone was for her head. The dog was by her feet. There wasn't anything he wouldn't have done. There wasn't anything she didn't mean by please don't. Mm. So this, uh, the second poem, um, the scene in the poem, since confrontation sort of requires a scene and requires people confronting. I mean, ideas can be confrontations, but... But you can you can embody ideas in actions. Um, so this scene takes place like 1970 in Hell's Kitchen, New York City. 
And uh, it took me about 30 years to get this poem as right as I've gotten. Uh, that's, that's the way poetry is anti-confrontational. <laughs> that is to say, it, it doesn't often like what it's doing, or it doesn't know how to get it right. So poetry, rather than being confrontational, is about being um, honest, involuntarily honest, about the strangeness of the experience, right? About the oddity of it, uh, about the unaccountable nature of it. You know, it's a thing we can trust, right? It's, it's probably the reason why you know, um, poetry is the news that stays new. Mm -hmm. There's always something odd. That you can okay, this one's called Blessing. It all happened so quickly. What I said, his fist, my sprawling, his drunken kicks, the bartender gripping my face in his huge hand once I struggled to my feet. Yet, it took forever, it seemed, like the irreversible lifetime between slammed on brakes. For years, I recalled only the figure I cut as I shrieked flat on my back and later groped along the floor for my glass. I see now how overdressed for that bar she was in her peasant skirt, richly embroidered, the black leotard top, the turquoise necklace. This was a bar where the drinking was serious and steady, the silence behind the backbeat sullen, stiff with craving. More of her than unscarred body comes into view, a girl's really, unfinished, all I knew. I hadn't noticed him then, but I do now. Gaunt, tattooed, with hard blue eyes, a vet, recently returned, bellied up, putting back bourbons before lurching. Who in hell do you think you are coming in with this like that? Tit sticking out, mocking us. Someone ought to teach you a lesson, girlie. And me, approaching. The lady doesn't want to be bothered. Can't you see that, friend? A line right out of the movies. Right before I went reeling across the floor, though, was a moment I owe to his hurt, revengeful eyes. Stepping between them, I forgot where I was, caught in the thrilling scent of perfume and sweat, the flush in her throat, just as he must have been, too. It stunned me. All I'd wished for until then had been beyond reach, unattainably elevated, and glorious, that pure curse of adolescence, which goes wry or bitter in us. My God, I thought, she's mine and meant I am crossing over. It stretched away before me like the land of milk and honey. When he turned me toward him, I had no idea why. I didn't feel that first punch. His fist kissed my chin like a blessing, stamping the instant indelibly with his vision of it as well. It was this, love is something I'll never have. Mm. Months later, her death was another punch. She died en route, narrowing the distance between us, a collision so powerful, it snapped her heart off its stem and disfigured her terribly. They sealed the coffin shut. No distance between us now. I can take her into more than my arms, wishing still for that life which no one could grant us, not ourselves then, not myself now. And yet, it's more than a daydream, more even than a memory. I let her take my hand, I let her lead me out. I can be the fool now, I could never be, I could never let myself be. I can give myself up to her greater conditionings. And there's, um, I could read one more if, I, if it's okay. All right. Uh, just because the, the one that follows it is um, one I wrote fairly recently in a book that I just gave you, Jerry, um, uh, in uh, December, um, that just sort of thinks about, uh, well, it doesn't say it in the poem, but it's thinking about an, a novel that I wrote sort of about that world of experience. Then. And the, the conceit in this book of poems called the Little Mirror is that I'm talking to this little mirror, just a piece of broken glass, mirror glass, and mostly I'm, since it doesn't hear what I'm saying and it doesn't talk back and is pretty much in 
not only inarticulate, but not even sentient, that makes it easy to talk to. <laughs> so that's, the, that's, that's just the, the formal thing behind the poem. Once, little mirror, I worked my brain to the bone, which isn't saying much. <clears throat> I was trying to set down what had happened to me and the part I played. I couldn't seem to do without embellishing. Soon, I couldn't distinguish what I made up from what I thought took place. What I had her say was so much more illuminating than what she hadn't. Plus, the heart of the matter was obscure and elusive. And before long, I was being faithful to what I had written, not to events, which I had not understood the first time around. And she was long dead by then. Pity for my stupidities drove me to make restitution to actualities I could not fairly depict, some of which I could barely recall. In real life, there was no saving us, and what justice I could do involved giving fantasy an unlikely likelihoods their due in constructing the fabric of a carbolic realism that felt true. I made up scenes that took on a life of their own, which you, little mirror, would have known all about, looking as you do unflinchingly at the dirty grout of bathroom tiles that smell of bleach and eyeliner, or the bright necklace in the fist of a child tottering toward her mother, or where she should have been and was no longer because, well, it hurts to think about how soon the hurt begins. No getting back to scratch, though maybe back to 10 to the minus 30th of a second is good enough to keep going, to move in the direction of making amends and of making the, pain feel, the painful feel properly painful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> is there a reason, Jerry, the clock is upside down here? Uh, that's because <laughs> it slid down as I was reading it. Trying that. to get closer to your powerful you were the words. One who wanted the clock. I know. I, I lost my watch. Um, so I want to thank Community Arts Partnership and Robin and and all the sponsors and Jerry and these wonderful poets that I'm reading with, really powerful work. Um, I'll read for you tonight. Oh, I, I want to mention something. Um, I have a recent project I'm doing. I'm, I'm placing contemporary Ukrainian poetry in uh, college libraries and libra public library systems. And I'm donating them to libraries that uh, can't afford to stock these on their shelves. So if anybody here has a recommendation or anybody out there has a recommendation or a suggestion, I welcome it. Uh, you can contact me through my website uh, if you're uh, shy tonight or if you're out there on the YouTube. Introduce yourself and give us your website. Oh, my name is Mary Gilliland and that's the name of my website. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I'm in the program for <laughs> spring break. <laughs> right. So I'll read for you uh, first uh, two poems from my chat book, The Ruined Wall Castle Garden. I don't know if you can see that up there. Um, and uh, these two poems are also in uh, coming soon. I'll, I'll have a, a new book uh, sometime this year. I, a month ago, I just got a little email that said that uh, my poetry collection has been awarded the Codhill Press Poetry Prize. So thank you. I encourage you all to keep sending. That manuscript has been a finalist for 20 years. <laughs> um, so the first one is actually, um, will be the first poem in, in, um, in that book, uh, The Devil's Fools. And I would say this poem is confronting the question of existence and what we are doing here. <laughs> so, <laughs> The woman in the hat paused, mole-eyed. We have plenty of stories. The left side of the neck, the bottom of the big toe, 
a shadow in the garden of prejudice against the wolf. Forward, without hesitating, not knowing whither, not there, any more than here, then where is God? We might be sick, blood loose in our entrails. The hard tread of conversation, for example, within ourselves, nowhere. Hastening upstairs, staring across at the window, remembrance torn in the sea wind, swiftly, blindly. Confronting ambiguity about one's parents. So <clears throat> the subject of this poem is Lizzie Borden, who denied she gave her father 40 wax with an ax, but that is how she's remembered. <laughs> <laughs> about to burn her dress. Where has she been this sweltering day since she paused beside the horsehair armrest and interrupted Mr. Borden's nap? Then glided by the kitchen where the maid was plunged into a sticky business, canning, and picked her way out to the shed. The nimbus clouds cut open, the sluice dulls her scarlet apron, crystals pitter patter on her nose. Or is the cloudburst something that, like so much else, only her far-fetching imagination sees. All river slips away, the shed's wood floor, the ax, the open door. Lizzie's willowy, an orphaned flower in the yard, and done with Papa's snores from the settee. Empty eyes raised to cold heaven. She stalks the plank that keeps her long skirt from fresh puddles on her way back to the house. Okay. Now I'll read one from experience. All the rest are gonna be in the devil's fools. Uh, critical mass disposed of grew from my contemplation and letting go of an instant incident with my mentally ill father. Critical mass disposed of. For years, I heard confusion clap its bell. Audience waiting on my words, my choice of speech tracked in a slay throat. You weren't quite balanced when you fashioned punishment. A ragged two by four across my cotton underpants. I had warned my friend, Presbyterian, she was on her way to hell. You corrected my first chance to pipe our church's spell. Old man, today I cradled pulses, compassion turned towards me, and talked memory drift aloud. The steady on-off beating through my fingers cleared it out. Converse. On the page, someone might read this as converse, but um, let's have a shout out to the English language. It is converse, reversal. And, um, it, and this poem uses the Parsifal legend of the hero questing for the Holy Grail to let the idealist in me encounter without violence, the worker bee in me who loves turning the soil. Converse, scout of the movement of sky, our man turns the field. He bends to examine the row, clumped with dung from the bull, hand in the grain sack that falls with his shoulder. Parsifal ambles toward the horizon. White breakers kneel on the blue of the sea. His sack is a fool's toggle slung round his neck. His fate, a hag on a horse instead of an income. Would that grail had the substance of grain, he cries to the farmer. The muffled return, spur your own flanks, not the horses. Each Clutches windstone 
Earth's molten core, fissured through limestone, pooled, cooled, and chipped, a piece of a wall or philosopher's stone, or dear animosity. Would that shadow could predicate mirror. Um, I'm going to read the last poem very slowly and pause at the line breaks. Um, and uh, it's written in two skinny columns. And if you're seeing it on the page, there are many deliberate misspellings and uh, very odd line breaks. And um, this poem embodies the ongoing paradox of being so, so different from the one you love. <laughs> it's called, we live in synchronicity. Synchronicity is, um, you know, a simultaneity of time. And so the poem's title is, we live in sin over the first column, chronicity over the second. There are treasure hunts I make that leave you scavenging for stimulation. Your capacity to be a captive of the screen leaves me unmoved. There are days we have no wishes for each other, just commands, forgetting the uniqueness of our history. You crave attention and magazine displays. I approval and tax rebates. <laughs> Will the gods inside your flickering box or mine behind the tree cut us a little slack? Fates single roofed our duplex roofs, separate but equal and yearning for one body, our private efforts look like willful acts and spiritual alibis. Let's wage domestic profit overlapped in time. If you would clean the ceilings, I'll consider floors. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> well, I had no idea that I had the power to uh, convene such a congregation of vulnerable old poets. So, wow, I didn't actually know what was going to happen, and uh, should do this every day. Um, I'm also delighted that. Um, uh, others brought to to the to the reading uh, understanding of confrontation that wasn't mine, which is seems to be agonistic. Um, but there's so much love and humor and uh, imagination. It's been really splendid. I did want to read one poem <laughs> for Zoe because um, this poem took place when Zoe lived just next door to us at a time when I was um, sort of at the age and time of life that so is in now. Did you notice the other new mothers walking by outside? This is entitled Dream After Birth. Three inches underground, I lay on my back, sleeping on fire. We were talking about being tired. A verse of flame from within, Roaring from every exhausted poor daylight smoke in sheets of flame, giving away my body's flume of light. That was a few days after the birth of my son. That was fire feeding the life to follow. Now, as I lay in the garden and gaze at the cool and perfect sky, I can still remember the air raid of my body, how I lay flaming a quivering flesh. In this simpler place, I no longer see the God of fire. Here, 
there are lilacs and daylilies, and the yellow eye of the daffodil, and the lit body of the rose. Maybe this is how it really is. There is no flame to cure the body, no fire to ease the soul, though no one could tell me as I lay down the loose veins of my body, open in the hive of the earth, that I wasn't doing what I wanted, that I wasn't being true. Um, I think I'm just gonna read one, one poem. Um, and then maybe uh, if we want to chat, we could do that. Um, that might be fun. Um, but no, you know, no pressure. Um, hmm. This is entitled, Night is Not Ignorant Nor Intelligent. Um, I usually tell my students, really, you know, shy away from telling war stories. Um, but I'm interested in um, what I can understand about myself, what, what I want. And I think this poem eventually arrives at some understanding. Night is not intelligent. Night is not ignorant nor intelligent. Out of the thug of tire and alcohol, I stood up from the family table to raise my bulk and shadow above my brother. Unwilling to not respond, my brother stood too. This was not a fight about God or country. My grievance was that I had worked all week and wanted the family car. It was Friday night. In answer to my toil, my brother needed the car to get to work. I hadn't finished my dinner. He had a job at a bar at a dis as a disc jockey. If he could just wait, I said, I would drive him. Clearly, I had grown dull from the fatigue of my day's manual labor and like a stooge whose resolve was unsoftened by beer. All I wanted was what I wanted. I hadn't anticipated my mother's cry, how frightened she would be when her grown son stood ready to ruin something in this small family's small dining room. Her frightened voice pulled me, down, pulled me with my shame down like an anchor. I took my plate into the backyard and sitting on a stump, finished my dinner in the dark. I had a sense where in a nearby town, my brother worked. When I was done, I got up, put my dish away and got on my bicycle. After an hour of peddling, I found the bar where he had his turntables and records. I hadn't seen this part of his life. When he saw me, he stood again, unsure at first why I was there, but soon accepted my apology and embrace. Back on my bicycle, relieved of my misdemeanor, I soloed home through the dark. Now I could see the stars and feel the sky, that larger presence as a companion. I had been peddling on the service road to the expressway when at the next intersection, a car crowded me to the curb and blew its horn to tell me I didn't belong on the road. My fist and middle finger went up in instant salute. A few minutes down the road, having regained the dark, I found myself alone again. Every once in a while, a car would go by. Two headlights, taillights, and then the dark was refreshed. I didn't recognize it from the intersection a few miles back when a car stopped in front of me. When two men got out of the car, I got it. Bolted by fear, I stood on the pedals, steered toward them and then around, pedaling hard. Within a minute, I reached the intersection. There was a policeman there attending traffic and I started to say something as the men rolled by in their car. But what was there to say? They had frightened me but what was the offense? From there, I pedaled home warily, but in the safety of known streets. When I got home, having finished work, my brother was there and, started, and I started to tell him what had happened. He was going out with a friend and said I could use the car. With my story half finished, I went into the garage and found a black wooden softball bat 
and an aluminum little leaguer with tape on the handle. I don't know if that's meaningful, but fear imprints discrete details in memory. I remember those bats. I hadn't used them since I was a boy. What was I after? I don't know. Night is not ignorant nor intelligent, but has its inclinations. Two men had nearly trapped me in the dark, and now I was out. What I was going to do was unclear, but the bats and the car were an equalizer, and I drove straight to the neighborhoods where I imagined the men, with nothing more to do, might pause at a bar or restaurant. Driving up and down the streets, looking along sidewalks and into parking lots, I was prowling. Would I strike somebody I had seen in the dark, do something to a car? I hadn't gotten that far. After an hour of driving around, I picked up a man hitchhiking to the next town. I told him the story of the man, the bicycle. Without hesitating, the man said, I knew it. I knew it when I saw the bats. When I stopped the car to let him off, he opened the door and the dim bulb broke the undiminished dark and shone on the man's pale, gaunt face. As he closed the door, he said in a voice, half prayer and half hiss, I hope you get your revenge. The uncured word, revenge, surprised me. But more, there was entitlement in your revenge, as if revenge was a deserved birthright. Revenge was identity as real as the gall that earlier had allowed me to break free. Revenge had warp and currency in the wealth of who I was. The car door closed, as if sealing a destiny. I don't know if it was the scrawny face, the shameless penury of his wish, or just how the light went out in the socket of the car's small chamber we had shared. I turned the car around and drove slowly home, grateful now for the dark inside the car, for the dark road and the dark sky with its tiny stars marking the immense dark and anonymous distances. Thank you. So questions for any of the readers, writers, or the writers want to make a note or thought, or I think we can hold on to the room until it gets dark. <laughs> so, Jared, you, you have uh, saved your darks. I saved my darks. Or, uh, right. 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 Um, we were talking about that. Uh, and I think we were talking about a time when I think it was um, Mark Strand wrote a book, It's Dark and I Go In, It's Dark and I Go Further In. And poets were using the word, relying on it. Um, and then you said this beautiful thing, but I'm letting the dark shine. I'll let the dark shine. Um, any comments or thoughts, uh, even just about the idea of putting together a reading like this or the, uh, what, are, what occurs to you in terms of thinking about what you've heard? Or any, any thoughts? Yes. I'm curious how you decided on confrontation as the theme and what made that feel necessary. Yeah. Um, I have an answer to that because I'm particularly interested in my own writing about what it takes for me to feel for others and what provokes uh, what often is sort of an antagonism to a more sympathetic response. This seems really important to me. Um, as you probably know, the uh, the uh, developmental psychologist, Jean Piaget, says that at the age of five, we can see from another's perspective. We can take, we can, we can have a sense of what they're experiencing. But it's my sense that that ability, which is really one of our greatest powers, needs to be recruited. We don't do it automatically. 
So I was interested in thinking about those confrontations and what occurs that um, gives us a sense of possibility. We were talking on the way over about the idea of confrontation. You were remarking that what poets do when they're given something is they subvert. And so it's been interesting to see six different attempts to subvert the idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In different ways. That's interesting. Right. I appreciate it. You you offered up the description and no further um, <laughs> Not, I was going to say like guidelines, but even desire, even suggestion. You're like, this is sort of how I pitched it, and then you left us all to run with it, how we, how we saw fit. Yeah, so right. Um, okay. So yeah, I didn't want to give a prescription. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, well, had you, we would have all ignored you, though. Right. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, I like uh, you're riding your bike around those two guys. You know, everybody's first inclination is to swerve. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Other than that, thoughts? Oh, I appreciate what David said about um, of, of our conflicts with others inside ourselves when they make poetry. That, uh, right. That's, right. That's the way around it. Yeah. Yeah. So when you say oppositions, you mean like um, when the poles of the magnets are the same, we're going to swerve away. When there's that Equal, yeah, yeah, okay, I got right. You. I mean, so when the, those two guys are out of the car, you know, right. I mean, that that's that's a moment that nothing can come of that, right? But something has to come of it, but it comes from what follows when the other guy gets in the car, right? And you get to think about revenge, right? It right. takes it takes it's a long journey for you to get to a place where you can sort of drop <laughs> your sort of sense of kind of conflict. Yeah. Unless you're your brother, unless you're your guys, with everything that's on your mind. Right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And you made a nice note about that, just in terms of what poets do, in terms of taking that time to understand. Yeah, yeah. I not, I asked the people on live stream if they have any questions. No, I'm waiting to see if anything pops up. People on live stream. Mm -hmm. They're on the spot. I know God will be good to me. <laughs> That's one, one of the last things my grandmother said in our last mm -hmm. oh, maybe it'll come from live stream. <laughs> <laughs> um, other thoughts or notes? Uh, I just thank you very much. Uh, it's just so much fun. <laughs> So I'm going to stand in front of the camera. So at uh, 7.15 um, tonight on Zoom, there's going to be The Forbidden Future, Literature and Journalism in Today's Russia. Uh, tomorrow, there's a zine workshop. I want to go to that. The Comics Drama Radio Hour that was going to be at the library has been canceled. Um, there's a group reading on Zoom at 5.30, and Dan yeah. is going to be part of that as well. Yeah. He double-dipped. <laughs> and then... You just sent me emails, and I just said yes to whatever you sent yeah. me. Yeah, he's also locking up tonight and putting away yeah. chairs, and you're doing some yard work at my house. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, tomorrow also at 7, a Zoom event, uh, performative readings. With Lini Stack, Yvonne Fisher, and Savianis Venescu. Mm -hmm. And on Sunday, Dr. Nia Nunn is going to talk about curricula of liberation and self discovery. And there's two more group readings at Buffalo Street Books tomorrow. And there's something with teenagers at the library tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Anyone have teenagers? Mm -hmm. Kids erasing the words and changing their worlds. It's in public at three o'clock at the library. So yeah, take a look at springrights.org. And thanks for being here. And if you are one of the writers, if you could write your name on that list over there, I would love you to answer a survey about how you heard about the event. I'm starting to suspect it's almost entirely word of mouth, which I really have to know so I don't spend all this money advertising. Mm -hmm. And then I can give more money to the artists. So filling out your name. Uh, ignore the thing that says Quilt Diva Exhibit. It's, I'm just double using something. Thank you, everyone, in the live stream.
Have fun tonight. Bye. <laughs>